Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I want to talk to you about probiotics. These are my favourite gut health supplement and maybe they're my favourite supplement of all time, of, of everything. So in, if you include other areas, so like hormonal health, liver health, skin health, all other aspects of health, they might just be my top tier supplement f like of, of all, of all time. And I'm going to explain why today. I'm hopefully going to help you understand why probiotics are so important and how not having them, so a probiotic supplement is basically replacing potentially missing organisms in the gut, why not having them is connected to basically any type of digestive disease, but also any other disease outside of the body that's influenced by the gut, which, surprise, surprise, is almost every single disease under the sun. So I'm going to be talking to you about why these are so important, why we need to supplement in the in the modern era, like in, in today's world, in the world that we live in, why do we need to take probiotic supplements? And from there, the harm that can come if we, if we don't. So like the jobs that they do and what will happen if these jobs aren't done. So probiotics, why are they so important? Why do we need to take them? And why are they my favorite gut health supplement? And potentially my favorite supplement of all time. So the reason probiotics are so important is we've actually evolved alongside of them. We often think that we are separate from nature, but we're actually a very core and fundamental part of nature. We are, we are animals. Biologically, we are animals. And every single animal on earth has a microbiome. They, they have a digestive tract and they, they, their digestive tract is full of different types of organisms. And the, the thing that makes a microbiome strong is diversity. So whether this is an animal, whether this is us as humans, obviously we potentially a more diverse diet, you know, say cows, they're eating grass and different types of like weeds and maybe some leaves here and there. Like we eat fruits, we eat different fruits from different countries, we eat animal products, we eat like cartilage, insects, we eat so many different things. So our microbiome diversity is probably representative of being more diverse as we have more diverse diets. But still, diversity is the key. I'll give you a statistic here. So for there's a, there's a correlation between microbiome diversity and basically e basically every disease. So the, the smaller diversity you have in your microbiome, the greater likelihood you are of developing almost any disease. So particularly true for gut disorders. So, you know, like IBS, Crohn's colitis, reflux, like specifically digestive order disorders, but also other, other disorders. So coronary artery disease and um, cardiac events. Uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. These are all directly inversely correlated with microbiome diversity, which means the more diversity you have in your microbiome, the lower likelihood you are of having any of these different types of diseases. So you can see having a good, strong microbiome really important. And then you might think, okay, well, microbiome diversity is important. And the scale of diversity that we're talking about here is, so a healthy person should have about... 2,500 plus different organisms, different species, different types of things going on in their gut. You know, worms, flukes, yeast bacteria, protozoa, methanogens, archaea, like there's a massive, there's a massive list. You don't need to know all of them and what they all are. But the more diversity you have, the better. And then you maybe ask me a question. Okay, so how will taking a small probiotic supplement that just has five, 10, 15, 20, 25 different strains of bacteria in it, actually really help me get to this level of diversity. You know, if I take 20 strains of bacteria in a probiotic, how is that gonna help me get 2,500 strains of diversity that a healthy person has? And it's a really good question, but I have an answer for you. So I want you to think about these, these strains that you would take in a probiotic as like the, they're like the, the infrastructure of the gut. They're like the police officers and the firemen and the, the emergency services, they're the, the gardeners and the plumbers, like their, their, their job is to create the infrastructure for the whole rest of the microbiome to function correctly. So like they're doing all of the building, they're doing all of the, they're taking care of everything, you know, they, they're the teachers, they run the schools, they, they, they basically run all of the infrastructure. And this is, this is actually primarily your lactobacillus and your bifidobacterium. 
um, species, these, these organisms. So you can take these very easily in a probiotic supplement. And you might think, okay, well, why is it that now we have to take these supplements? Like, why did my great-grandmother not have to do this? Like, why did my ancestor that lived in a cave not have to take these probiotic supplements? First of all, that's actually, like, it's a good question, but it's actually a, the, the question actually in itself is wrong. It's um, your ancestors did take probiotics. They just didn't do it through a probiotic supplement. If you look back at every single ancestral culture on the planet, so you can go anywhere on all of planet Earth. You can go into the polar regions. You can go equatorially. You can go to the Mediterranean. You can go to the Caribbean. You can go to the America. You can go anywhere you like. Every single ancestral culture on planet Earth had some form of fermented food in their diet. On a regular basis and we're talking like at least weekly more often than that is it's daily and this is for several reasons first of all it preserved food so people had access to food in other areas of the of the of the year where they wouldn't be able to have those foods so for example you harvest all of your your grain your grapes your cabbages and then it's winter it's like well if you don't they didn't have refrigeration so they had to preserve them some way so they make wine they make sauerkraut they could distill them into different things, you know, fermented foods providing probiotics. Also, they, they taste good, you know, there's a lot of diversity. Modern food processing is, is modern, it's new, you know, we didn't have ways to refine food as much back then. And getting some different types of variety in your food was nice, you know. Sauerkraut has really nice, interesting flavours. Wine, super popular, super common. Even things like coffee and cacao are actually fermented. So... These were food processing techniques that not only improved the, the 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 time that these foods would stay like edible and safe, but they would also incorporate extra like taste and and like interesting um, experiences for people to actually eat and and enjoy. But there's an even further layer to this. It was safe. You know, it made food safer. There was one funny thing I remember learning in school. Actually, one of the one of the use, maybe maybe useful, maybe useless things I actually learned in school was in in um, in 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 England. The water system wasn't very safe, so people actually used to drink beer, like a very weak kind of beer, because it was a fermented food, and the bacteria in that fermentation process would make that beer safer than just drinking like the, the water supply because it wasn't really safe and you'd even have like six or seven eight year old kids drinking beer not because there's a high alcohol content but because it's just safer than than drinking the water and this is because these these organisms that grow in here they kill the pathogenic organisms they create an environment that they like that the pathogens don't like and they are very compatible with our gut so when we when we would do this it would improve food safety as well and improve food safety outcomes so this is one reason that if you get food poisoning there's almost unquestionably an aspect of gut microbiome weakness because your gut microbiome is designed to protect you from from pathogens and if you do have food poisoning for any reason using probiotics is going to be a very powerful modality for you a very powerful treatment for you because you've got pathogenic organisms growing in the gut and you can use probiotics to kill them to to move them out to help your body expel them and to move back to health again so ancestrally we have had probiotics in our diet for basically since the whole time of, of human evolution like they are a core part of 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 health and they have been a core part of what humans have been exposed to so it's not that just now that we're in a modern era we need to take them we've always taken them we're maybe just a little bit disconnected from that because now you buy sauerkraut in the supermarket and it's pasteurized or you buy yogurt and it's pasteurized and that didn't exist back then. You just couldn't get those things. There's an extra layer to this as well. So this is we're going to actually look a little bit at the gut right now. So your gut plays a really important role in detoxification. There's a, a six-step process that the body uses to remove the majority of toxins that you're exposed to in your environment from your body. These are in particular are the fat soluble toxins. So this is the, the mold and the mycotoxins. This is the heavy metals. This is plastics, pesticides, estrogenic compounds. All of these fat soluble toxins. These are all going to be excreted by your body through your gut. The last three steps of this six step process are, are in your gut. So it's your bile, your digestive system and your microflora and then having a bowel movement. You can hear microflora is a part of this process. 
So if you are if you are lacking in the correct microbiome, your body cannot detox. And there are a lot of things in our environment that need to go out through this pathway that actually destroy the microbiome. So if you're exposed to mycotoxins, if you're exposed to antibiotics, if you're exposed to um, pesticides, like these things kill bacteria, they kill microbes. But the way that your body removes them from itself is, is actually with taking these, these toxins, moving them through the gut and binding them with your healthy probiotic organisms. So if you are exposed to these things, you lose your microflora and your microflora actually plays an essential role in removing these things from your body. So you kind of can get stuck in this vicious cycle where you're exposed to toxins that kill your microbiome, which then puts your body in a state where it cannot remove these toxins from itself and then that perpetuates chronic disease. Your body gets stuck accumulating, bioaccumulating these, these toxins that it can now no longer rid itself of. And it's also very interesting because a lot of toxins we're exposed to through our mouth. So it could be amalgam fillings, even if you're exposed to um, agricultural chemicals, food, glyphosate, even like mycotoxins, like you, even if they go into your lungs, they, the lungs bring them out and then we swallow them and they go through the gut. You've got these toxins that even if they go through your skin, they eventually moved through the bile, they end up in your gut. Like the common denominator for all of this is your gut. And if your gut flora has been damaged to an extent where you no longer have these species that are helping you to bind these toxins and remove them, then your body will just encourage anything to grow to do that job. And this is where you get, you're get you looking at like parasites or candida or um, SIBO or these other types of um, gut dysbiosis conditions. Because this is a job that your body needs an organism to do. It can't do it itself. As I said, it has evolved alongside nature and it's outsourced this job to other organisms it needs something to help it do this and it can't do it by itself so if you don't have these right healthy optimal species to do it for you it will get something else and these are something else species that are going to give you bloating and gas distension digestive problems lower your energy and give you all of these other side effects that you get from having a gut dysbiosis but just killing them isn't the solution because they're there to do a job. So we need to make sure we put the correct species back in to do that job. And now you might be asking, what are those correct species? So what I would say is, let's look at what our ancestors did. What types of species were they getting in their fermented foods? You know, what did they get in their in their wines, in their kefir, in their in their yogurts, in their sauerkrauts? This is Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium organisms. This is what people would have been getting. You get more of the bifidobacterium in the dairy and more of the lactobacillus in the vegetable um, vegetable products. But you get a little bit of both on either. And they're both very important. These are like, as I said, these are the infrastructure of the gut. These are the builders. These are the, so thinking about that literally, these are the builders. These are the organisms that are living on your gut lining tell it how to repair itself you know they they live in your gut you've got these little microvilli you've probably seen like an activia advert on the tv with these little wiggly finger like protrusions alongside every single one of these you've got apartment buildings that all your bacteria live in and they don't just live in there they build those apartment buildings as they're living in there if your gut is becoming damaged you know if you've exposed to gluten and then you've got food sensitivities and you can't digest your food correctly your gut lining gets damaged it becomes leaky you lose the ability to digest food correctly you lose the the apartment building so you can't house these organisms correctly anymore and you need to you need to have these organisms back there to build this lining back up and to build this integrity and this strength and if it's not if they're not there it, it can't do it again your body needs these things to do this your body has evolved alongside these species and alongside these organisms for millennia and it needs them like they're an important part of this process you can provide all the building materials you can give it the glutamine you can give it the glycine you can give it all of these different building blocks to build a new gut lining but if you don't have the builders it can't do it like if you've got a construction site that has all the best materials and it's there's no builders there nothing's getting built so you have to put those builders back they also do other jobs, like they do the caretaking, you know, they do the gardening, they rake out the weeds. So if you've got pathogens that have started overgrowing, you've got, I don't know, dandelions and like thorns and thistles and all these like nasty things you don't want on your in your nice pristine garden. These are the things that go and they trim them, they cut them, they mow the grass. If you don't have them there, your garden's going to be wild. There's going to be loads of species overgrowing there. They're the police officers. 
they go there, they they find, oh, there's a parasite here, like, let's take it out, like, let's arrest him, let's kick him out, you know, they do that, if they're not present, that job is not getting done, they're the firefighters, if you've got gut inflammation, they're the ones that come along and say, oh, look, immune response, there's, the, the immune system's dysregulated, it's creating too much inflammation, this is not the right amount, you know, they, 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 they control the situation, they calm things down, they're, the factory workers, you know, they, they break your food down for you. They make it so that you can assimilate and absorb it. They're breaking down your 5-HTP into serotonin so you can actually use that in your gut for motility. They're letting you absorb that so it goes to your brain so you have serotonin so you feel happy and you feel like okay and you don't have anxiety and depression. Like they do all of these things and if you don't have them, your body can't do all of these things. So you can see how this is why I'm saying this is my favorite gut health supplement, but also how this can be my favorite supplement for the whole rest of your body. Because if your brain doesn't have neurotransmitters because they're not coming from the gut, you don't feel good. If your liver can't function because of all of the, the different processes that your gut is involved in with your liver, maybe, maybe through like bile deconjugation or nutrient absorption, pr synthesizing and providing and optimizing the bioavailability of different nutrients like B vitamins, if that job's not happening, your liver's struggling, like everything leans on your gut, you know, all disease begins on your gut, and if you have a gut dysbiosis, if you're missing these right species in your gut, your gut is going to struggle. So where do we start? Well, I've got, I've got actually several guides on YouTube of how to use probiotics. I always prefer to use a, a probiotic rather than a fermented food initially, because it's a controlled, standardized dose, you know, you can be like, okay, I can take half of this scoop, I can take half a capsule, that's my t level of tolerance. When you take a fermented food, the amount of probiotics is different in all of them. You don't just have probiotics, you've got polyphenolic compounds, you've got things like high dose vitamin C, you've got a bunch of, like even these organisms have their own virome, and there's always a difference of what different organisms are gonna be there. It's so much more complicated and it's so much harder to measure. So start on a, on a probiotic and work your way up. Work your way up with the dose and also work your way up with the diversity as well. So dosage wise, I find a therapeutic dose can start as, for some people as low as 1 billion CFUs. But eventually you need to be working in the range of 200 billion to even a trillion CFUs because your gut microbiome ha is, it, it has so many organisms in there. Like in, in, in your colon, we're talking trillions and trillions and trillions of organisms. And just throwing in like one of those cheapy, crappy probiotics that you buy at like Holland and Barrett or at the health food store and they're like, five million cfus it's like it's like the house is burning down and you you like get a teaspoon of water and you throw a teaspoon of water at that. it does nothing it's just it's basically pointless you know you need to get a high enough dose that you're actually going to make a difference and you want to start with a small amount of species and then you want to increase with the diversity over time so some really really nice ones that you can start with that are gentle Generally, I find bifidobacterium is more gentle than lactobacillus. So if you're really sensitive, start on the bifidos. And you could look at using either bifido, bifidobacterium infantis, which is a, an organism that was found in, in children's gut. So you can hear infantis, infant. And they found it in the, in the gut of infants. This is like a, one of the, the core microbiome organisms for children, and it helps to build their gut and get them ready for... For, for life, you know, it, it's one of those foundational ones that builds the gut up and helps them be able to start tolerating foods and food introductions. It sets a nice space in the gut for, for other microbes. Another one that can be really nice is lacto, no, is bifidobacterium longum. This one is really cool because it it really does a good job of increasing diversity and making the, making it so that your gut is a nice environment for other species and organisms. So one thing it can do is it can eat certain certain mucosal polysaccharides. So it eats some of the secretions that your gut produces, some of this mucus, and it eats it, and then it poops out different types of prebi prebiotics that feed other types of organisms. So it's kind of a bit like the mum. You know, it's like the mama bird. It, it eats some of this food, and then it throws it up in the baby's mouths to feed them and, like, help them grow. You know, it's like the mother of the gut. It's one of those organisms that's really... Um, gentle and loving and supportive of, of, of health. So those are two you can start with. And start on a few, a few species. So if you need to do one at a time, you know, you can start on Infantis and then move to, um, and then move to Longham. But start on like, say like five or six strains. And then you want to move to seven, eight, nine, ten. And then you want to move to 15, 
20. And then at 20, maybe you want to start thinking about adding some beneficial yeasts as well, because in kefir, you've got a lot of beneficial yeasts. So you could look at adding a beneficial yeast at that point. And then from there, you want to up that dose and then consider trying fermented foods as well if you're able to tolerate it. I know with histamine intolerance and different sensitivities, it's harder. But as you work on correcting the gut microbiome, you'll you'll see your sensitivities become a thing of the past. You know, your gut is designed to handle these foods. It's just if it's missing the correct machinery, it won't be able to do it. The microbiome is a hugely important thing, but there are some other factors in your gut that do influence your food tolerance. And I do cover those in depth in one of our, the courses that we offer, the gut health bundle. And inside that, there's the five the five pillars to heal your gut. So you've got stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa. If you've got dysfunction in one of those and your microbiome, that is like, I guarantee that is what is causing your, your gut problems. If you, first of all, you can... If you can figure out what where the the gut dysfunction is, if it's in one of these things and support it, you will you will manage this. You'll, you'll see symptom improvements like almost like like I'm talking like literally like 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 now like immediately. But also supporting whatever dysfunctional pillar you have is a recipe for setting up your gut for good health and setting up the rest of your body for good health in the long run. So like symptoms are your body saying something is wrong. If you can take care of that symptom, if you can figure out what the symptom is telling you and to take care of it you've basically aligned your body with healing in the long run because there's now no longer dysfunction. And then eventually you don't have to support the dysfunction anymore because it, it corrects itself because the body has self-healing mechanisms. But microbiome, huge important part of that. Those five pillars, stomach acid, digestive enzymes, bile, motility, mucosa, are all regulated by your microbiome. So if you don't have the correct microbiome species, if your microbiome is imbalanced, all of those are going to struggle. So it's really important that we do all of this at the same time. You know, if you do one, then the other, then the other, then the other, you're not going to get the same results as if you do them all at the same time because your body is holistic and it needs that holistic support. So to summarize, probiotics are not something new that we've just decided that we need to take as supplements. Ancestrally, we had probiotic organisms in our diet basically all year round, every single um, ancestral culture on planet earth had some form of fermented foods in their diet so it's not a new thing we're just doing it in a bit more of a modern way you know you can take it in a capsule instead of taking it in a in a fermented food if you can do fermented food wonderful then then do that but not everybody can and if you're watching this video th that's probably you if you can tolerate it great but otherwise start on a probiotic start on a low dose start on a low amount of species generally uh, bifidobacterium infantis and bifidobacterium longum are a gentle species that help you get started and from there you can increase diversity and dosage i find effective dosage starts at potentially 1 billion for some but you can go upwards of like 200 billion to a trillion so that would be like a thousand billion is it what i find to be an effective dosage and you want to increase the, the strains and the species as you do this. So going from in the infantis and the longum to then adding some other lactobacillus and bifidobacterium st strains and species until you get to 5, 10, 15, 20. And then maybe consider adding some probiotic yeasts as well. You could use Saccharomyces boulardii. Or at that stage, you could consider trying like kefir. And then you're going to be getting the natural yeasts that are present in that. Your gut is the foundation of your health. And the foundation of your health is your microbiome so take care of it it's involved in every single function in your body you know your your brain your neurotransmitters your micronutrient absorption everything that happens in your body costs calories if your body's not assimilating calories efficiently you're going to struggle you know take care of your gut and the rest of the body will thank you take care of your microbiome and your gut will thank you that's everything for today hope you find it really helpful and if you do have any questions please let me know i will see you soon take care Bye bye Oh, we have a comment here. Corin says, "I stepped up to grass-fed. I stepped up to grass-fed kefir and A2 yogurt. That you're hitting in the big leagues. There, you know, kefir is the the top. Is the top top tier. You know, it's S S plus tier. You can't get stronger, more diverse than than kefir. You just can't. So you're up in the big leagues. You say it hurts sometimes, but I know I need it. If it's hurting, maybe it's a dosage thing. You know." It's so powerful. It can feel almost stupid, like almost ridiculous if you just take half a teaspoon. You're like, was there even a point? But you'll actually get more probiotics in that half of a teaspoon of kefir than you'll get in a whole bowl of yogurt, in a in a whole probiotic supplement, like in a whole capsule. It's it's crazy.
So it might be a dose thing. It maybe you just need to Goldilocks zone it and work your way up a little bit more slowly. Ceci, uh, we have a question from Ceci. Thanks for the question, Ceci. She says, do probiotics help with acid reflux? Yeah, probiotics are definitely going to help with acid reflux. So it's always contextual, but generally with acid reflux, you've got, I'd say the most common problem people with acid reflux have is the acid in the stomach is actually not strong enough and it's causing the valve at the top of the stomach to not close correctly. The sphincter isn't closing correctly. So in improving the stomach acid levels is, is really, really important. And, and if you've had lower acid for a while, unquestionably, your microbiome will change and organisms will start to colonize inside of the stomach, particularly ones that want to lower your stomach acid. So this would be like Candida and uh, H. pylori. They like to lower your, your acid so they can live in that environment. Taking a, a probiotic is really important because often we have low acid because of either this, think, this, this sphincter problem and the only way you can fix that is by getting your stomach acid levels to be stronger again. And your body is, in, is smart, it's intelligent. It knows that it needs to produce more acid, but it's not doing it for a reason. One of the common reasons is the lining in the stomach has become damaged. And this can be because of these organisms, the H. pylori, the candida. You don't even have to do like tests and stuff. A lot of, a lot of people that have these problems do a H. pylori test and they're negative. They do a candida test and they're negative. Like you, you can't always pick these things up on tests. But certain microbes can start overgrowing in the stomach because the acid isn't strong enough and then they damage the lining and your body being intelligent knows that if it produces enough acid that it needs to kill these organisms and digest the food correctly and close this valve at the top it's actually going to irritate the stomach lining and can cause things like gastritis so it won't it won't produce this acid at that strong level because it's smart so making sure that we heal that that stomach lining is really important and probiotics are a really good way to do this in this case, especially the, the acid-loving organisms, so like Lactobacillus acidophilus. So if you break acidophilus down, this is its name, acidophilus means acid, means acid, and ophilus means loving. So it means acid-loving. It means this is a species of, of, of probiotic bacteria that loves acid. So taking, an, or taking a, a supplement that has Lactobacillus acidophilus actually helps with improving stomach acid secretions, and it it helps with creating a, uh, a stronger um, situation in your stomach and correcting that microbiome imbalance that you may have in the stomach and encourages your body to produce more acid. It actually produces acid itself. So it eats some of the food that you, that you give it. So when you're eating your food, it produces lactic acid, which is not the same type of acid as the acid that your stomach produces, but it's, it doesn't really matter it still produces acid, which is going to signal that valve at the top that it needs to close. And that's going to allow it to stop refluxing up. I also think it's worthwhile mentioning, just a bit of a side tangent, not microbiome related. A, a common cause of um, reflux is a hiatal hernia. And you don't have to have surgery to get this fixed. You can just go to an osteopath or a physiotherapist that is qualified in visceral massage and they will massage it back into the correct position, which allows this valve and sphincter to start functioning correctly again. I always think it's worthwhile if you do have any kind of gut stuff, especially like stomach, um, gastritis stuff, go and see someone that, that, that can work the fascia of the, and the organ systems like physically and just make sure that it's all in the right place. Because if it's not in the right place, it's not going to work correctly. And you can get this fixed. Like I had a hiatal hernia and it was giving me... Um, a bunch of different types of like gastric emptying stuff, reflux, and I fixed it in three treatments and it's, it's never been a problem since. So it's really, I, I really encourage people to do that. So I hope that helps, Ceci. And Corin here says, what if we don't have a gallbladder? That's a, that's a tricky one. That's going to affect your microbiome. I would say the most important thing if you don't have a gallbladder is you need to be, you need to be consistent with your fat intake. You need to be taking at least 30 grams of fat with every meal because your gallbladder is your, your liver is producing bile all of the time and if it doesn't have anything to bind to you're going to struggle with that bile if it isn't being bound to something irritating the gut lining and changing the microbiome composition so making sure that you have some fat when you're eating is really important and it is going to affect your gut lining and your microbiome. So taking probiotics, I mean, even if you didn't have this, you still need to take probiotics, right? Because they are, everybody, 
everyone on earth used to take probiotics through through fermented foods so you you need to do it but you definitely need to do it if you don't have a gallbladder because it's going to help with repairing that lining and it's going to support your body in um handling the the situation you know not having the gallbladder is going to affect the microbiome so you need to be more vigilant about making sure that you're taking care of it it didn't affect me for 17 years until until last year so in that in that case, it's probably like the you know the, the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing. Your body's just accumulated too much stress and it can't can't keep up anymore. So uh, providing it whatever support you can will be really really helpful. Do I recommend the delactate ones? Yes. So this is the delactate free probiotics by by Custom Probiotics. These have the the Bifidobacterium longum strain that I talked about in today. I can't remember off the top of my head if they have the Infantis one. I don't think they do. But I really, I really love these. These are a really nice, a nice place to start. Um, if you're doing kefir already, then the kefir is more powerful. But if you are having a bit of pain or discomfort from it, maybe stepping back a bit and trying something that's more standardized, so you can get a, a more reliable success, would be helpful. Can't add the link in a, in a live. It's really easy though. You just go on, you just go on Google, type custom probiotics. If you're, if you're in Canada, they have their separate website. If you're in Europe, you can use a website called Mandy Mart to get it instead. But if you're in, in the US, you just type custom probiotics and then you just have a look through their products and you'll want to find the one that's called D-Lactate Free Formula. Very easy to find. You can even just go on Google and type custom probiotics D-Lactate Free and it'll probably come up as the first link. So I've got a dash. I have an appointment coming up soon. Um, but thanks for all the questions. Hope it was really helpful. Take care. I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.